happen. Uh, when we're under a king, whatever he decrees, um, we should follow it. And, and I think at times we don't always see Jesus as, our, as king of every aspect of our life. So today I want to celebrate the fact that Jesus is king over all the powers, over all the authorities, and I want to invite you to make him king of every aspect of your life. So before we start today, um, I just wanted to share something God's put on my heart this week. And it's kind of uh, something he put on my heart a little bit earlier, and it's kind of stuck on my heart throughout the week. So I just want to share that before we start. Um, I was reading through 1 Corinthians, and Paul is talking about a a time when they have to discipline someone in the church. And in the context of this passage, he says in 1 Corinthians 5, He says, so when you are assembled, and I, Paul, am am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, and then he continues on to say his instructions. But for some reason, that verse just jumped out to me like it's never jumped out to me before. He said, when you are assembled, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of the Lord is present. It just, as I thought about this, things jumped out in my mind of, Remember when Jesus said, when two or three are gathered, I am with them, there I am with them? And, and we've been talking during our spiritual gift series about the body of Christ, how we together, when we come together, we are the body of Christ. So for some reason, this just jumped out to me. I thought, when we get together, when we, when we gather, the power of the Lord is present. And I don't think we always understand that. Maybe we don't grasp that, but, but it is... It is powerful when we come together because Jesus is here with us. We are his body. So I just wanted to share that. It was just kind of something that happened this week that I, I felt God put on my heart. So, so we'll kind of come back to that maybe a little bit at the end of, of my message. So let's shift gears a little bit and uh, talk about Palm Sunday. Today is Palm Sunday. In case you didn't catch the message with all the palm, palm branches. Uh, and so what is Palm Sunday? Um, is it the Sunday when we go to the beach and have church on the beach with palm trees around us? That would be nice, wouldn't it? I actually used to go to a cottage where they, they were, would do church on the beach, and it was actually really nice. So anyways. Um, so no, Palm Sunday is the Sunday we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It's when he came... Uh, when he came, rode down the Mount of Olives on a donkey and rode into Jerusalem as Israel's true king and as the world's true king. Um, if you remember the story, people were, as he was coming, people were, were waving palm branches. They were putting their cloaks down on the, on the road in front of him. And these were all signs in that time of, of a, ki- a new king reigning. There's a story in, in First Kings when uh, someone is is proclaimed to be the king, and people immediately take their cloaks off and put them on the ground. So all of these signs are signs of people seeing Jesus as their king. They were bringing in a new king. And even the the words Hosanna and and all of these things they're saying are are recognition that Jesus is king and he has come to save. So let's actually just read the story together. Um, I have it in Luke 19. Verse 28 to 40, if you have your Bibles. Luke 19, verse 28 to 40. So here it says, After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? That's my donkey. <laughs> they didn't say that. but they, they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road, And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. 
in other verses, in other uh, books, it says, Hosanna, Hosanna. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd, uh, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Isn't that such a cool line? That's where, that's where Jesus does the mic drop. If, the, if they keep quiet, the stones are going to cry out. All of creation knows that I am king. If my disciples don't cry out, all of creation will. So at face value, when we, if you don't have a strong knowledge of this story or, or of the Bible, if you read this story just briefly, you, you might just think, okay, Jesus is coming to Jerusalem and his, his disciples are worshiping him and, and praising him. And that's, that's true. Uh, but there's a lot of richness to this text. There's a lot of layers that as we peel back the text, you'll notice there's a lot of rich nuance and a lot of imagery here. So if, if we read this, pa- this passage in the, uh, in the Gospel of John, we see that Jesus came into Jerusalem during the Passover. So the Passover festival. You guys remember the Passover story in Exodus? And so it's basically when the Jews would remember when God delivered them out of slavery, out of Egypt. And so they celebrated this. And they celebrated it in a very specific way. So I just want to explain a little bit about how Jews in this context uh, celebrated the Passover. So, oh, there's a cute little lamb there. Uh, So on the 10th day of Nisan, or Nisan, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it. But this, on the 10th day of Nisan, each Jewish family got one person from their family to go and pick an unblemished, unblemished one-year-old lamb. So they would look for the lamb that was perfect, and they would, they would select that lamb. And then for four, days, uh, for four days, they would examine it, and they would allow other people to come and examine the lamb and test it to see if it was perfect. Because you don't want to offer something to God that's not perfect. And so f- for four days before... Uh, before the Passover, they would, they would examine it. And then on the 14th day of Nisan, the lamb was brought to the temple where it was sacrificed. Uh, its blood was poured out on the altar, and they would bring the lamb home and celebrate the Passover meal together. So this was, there's other things involved in the Passover celebration, but, but these are some of the main things that, that Jews in that time did. And there's a lot of really interesting parallels between the way the Jews practice Passover and Jesus. As we see, we'll, we'll talk about some of them here, but there's a lot of overlap, a lot of imagery of Jesus uh, as our Passover lamb. So um, on the 10th day of Nisan, when all the Jews, Jewish families were picking the lamb, this is the day when Jesus rode into to Jerusalem. This is the day when he rode in. He was God's chosen lamb. And then, if you remember the story, while he was in Jerusalem, a lot of the experts in the law and the Pharisees were really throwing these really hard questions at him. Uh, Should we pay taxes to Caesar? um, What happens at the resurrection? Uh, What's the greatest commandment? They were just lobbing all of these, these experts, these like scholars were lobbing these really hard questions at Jesus. And as we know, he just navigated it so perfectly. So they tested him and he proved to be pure. And then on the 14th day of Nisan, when all the Passover lambs were being uh, slaughtered, this was the day when Jesus was crucified. Don't you think that's interesting? I thought that was really, really cool. And it gets even more interesting when we start to think about what, what is the Passover festival? What was it all about? What was the Passover in Exodus all about? Does anyone, you guys remember the story, I'm sure many of you know the story of of God when he uh, delivered his people out of Egypt. What were some of the things God accomplished during the Exodus? What were the things he did? Does anyone feel free to say? Respond if you want. What, hap- what happened in Exodus? There's a lot, of, a lot of things that God accomplished or things that happened. Yeah? God sent the Israelites to Yes, God set, set his people free from slavery in Egypt. So freedom was a big part of Exodus. Sure. Yep. God demonstrated his sovereignty and power in the small 
You, yeah, you guys are actually going point to point of the, the points I'm going to make. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Any, who's got point number three? <laughs> who's got point number three? Did you put that up before people commented? <laughs> what else did God do in the Exodus story? I got like four more points. So. Yeah. Sorry? He could provide for them, yeah. Yes, he provided for them, for sure. Yep. <laughs> it is, it is, actually. Point number four is God worked miracles. He provi- and providing for them was, was miraculous. <laughs> God showed his love for his people. You got the cheat sheet back there. He showed his, love, his deep love for this people who was really suffering. Anything else, you guys? That comes to mind? Yep. Judgment of God's enemies, enemies. yep. Yeah. That's another part of it, for sure. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So he protected them, yes. Provided a way to save them and free them, and, and he protected them as well, yeah. These are all elements of the Exodus story. Yep, and God, God worked miracles. Uh, his, his tangible presence was with his people. Um, if you remember when he took them out of Egypt while they were in the wilderness, God led them by, by a cloud by day and by a uh, pillar of fire by night. There was a lot of crazy, and he, he parted the waters. There was a lot of miraculous stuff that, that happened when God was present with his people when God led them out of Egypt. And so again, what are the overlaps between what Jesus accomplished and what Exodus was all about and Passover was all about? Jesus saves us. He saves us from sin. First Peter says, He redeemed us from the empty way of life handed down to us by our ancestors. He redeemed us from our old life. And I'm sure uh, most of you have, when you look back on when you first came to Jesus, you you'll probably think similar to me, like, my life before Christ, what was I thinking? Like, what was I doing? I was so enslaved to so many things. I, was, I would hurt people, and it was like, when you're in Christ, you look back on your, your past and think, Lord, you brought me out of so much. You brought me into a new life, and, and it's powerful. So Jesus saves us uh, from our old self. Jesus is king over all. Um, Oh, I forgot to mention on, in Passover what Laurie was saying. When, Jesus, or when God established himself as king over all the Egyptian gods, all of the plagues that God sent were actually plagues that kind of responded to the Egyptian gods. So, so just one example. Um, there was one Egyptian god who was a god of fertility, and he, he's often depicted as having a frog's head. And so in, in any pictures you see, he's this god with a, a human body and a frog head. And he was the god of fertility. And do you remember what God did in, past, in Exodus? Or he, sent, he sent the plague of all the frogs, like tons of frogs. He sent them on the land. Isn't that a cool way of saying, I am superior, I am the god above all gods? And so uh, Jesus, when he comes, and when he comes riding into Jerusalem, he proclaims that he is the king. And God makes him above all the other powers. He established him above all the other powers. God gave, uh, Philippians said, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name. Jesus shows his love for us. Um, You could just see the love of Jesus in, in his sacrifice for us, but also in his life with his disciples. He washed their feet. He he cared for them. He was, he was deeply loving. And God is the same today. God is the same today. And Jesus worked miracles and still works miracles in our midst. And Jesus gives us uh, the Holy Spirit and is present with us. Kind of what I was saying at the beginning, that as we come together, the power of the Lord is present and, and God is with us. So there's a lot of overlap between the Passover and the, and the Exodus story and the life of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I thought this was really cool. I, as I was thinking about it, I thought this is such, such, interesting, such an interesting image. 
In 1 Peter 1, verse 18 to 23, Peter talks about Christ as the Passover lamb. And there's a few passages in the New Testament where they talk about Christ as the Passover lamb. So here it says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in the last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and your hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have a sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Again, see all, see all the Passover and Exodus imagery here? Uh, you were redeemed. You were, that's what slaves were redeemed when they were taken out of slavery. <clears throat> he, was, he was a lamb without blemish or defect. Uh, he was chosen. It says he was chosen by God. So Jesus is our Passover lamb. So this, this is a, like I said, this is a very cool image. This is very cool that uh, there's a lot of overlap here. But this has the potential to just become some cool ideas, some cool theology. Um, <laughs> I want to share this kind of an embarrassing story from my, my past. When, just to show kind of how, how our theology, well maybe I'll just share the story. Uh, it was about me in grade 7 and when I was sitting in class with some of my, my friends, one of my friends just started asking me about my faith. And I was like, oh, cool, this is like, this is awesome. This is, uh, yeah, this is a great opportunity for me to share about Jesus and to share the gospel. And so he started asking, like, so what do you believe? And, like, why did Jesus come and die? Like, what is all that, what's that all about? And so I'm like, yes, I'm a, I'm a pastor's kid. I know my theology. I know my, my, uh, Old Covenant, new, new Covenant stuff. So I was like, I started going into it and saying, well, uh, under the Old Covenant, um, people had to sacrifice sheep for, for, to atone for their sins. And then now Jesus came and he was the ultimate lamb who was sacrificed for our sin. So we don't have to live under that Old Covenant anymore. And I was feeling good. I was like, we, I nailed it. I, I went into Old Covenant theology and then talked about the New Covenant and I, I feel like I really nailed it. And then he comes back and says, he he thinks for a second, and he's like, so Jesus came to save a bunch of sheep? (laughs) That's why he came? Just to save a bunch of sheep from getting killed? And I was like, hmm, I think I, (laughs) I think something's off here. Maybe I, (laughs) maybe I didn't communicate this well. But I, (laughs) I think, I think at that point I was, I, I knew kind of the stuff. I knew the imagery. I knew, I knew some of the, some of the theology behind Jesus's death, uh, but I didn't really understand at that point how it applied to our life, how it applies to today, because Jesus's death and his resurrection does have real-world implications for us today. It actually does affect us; it changes us, and it impacts our lives. And I just thought that was a funny, funny story because I was just so clueless as to <laughs> what he was thinking. And I just, yeah. So what does it mean for us today that Jesus is the Lamb of God? Did Jesus come just to save a bunch of sheep? No, I don't think so. Sorry, Jeff. And, you know, <laughs> they're, they're sheep farmers. So. Jesus, Jesus came to set us free. Jesus came to set us free. Freedom. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. A lot of times I think we, we focus a lot on Jesus' death as atonement, which it was. It 100% was. But he didn't just come to, to just cover our sin. He came to give us freedom. It all comes together in a package. He came to bring us freedom. Freedom from sin. Freedom from being enslaved to, to sin. Freedom from our old self, which is in bondage to... Um, to evil, 
free to become more like Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17 to 18 says, Now the Spirit, now the Lord is the Spirit. Sorry. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. I'm going to read that one more time because I think it's pretty powerful. Now the Lord is Spirit, is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We are being transformed to become more like Jesus. And as I've, as I've thought about it, um, a lot of the imagery in the New Testament is around we collectively are the body of Christ. We collectively are the body of Christ. So when we come together as a church and when we live in love to one another, we collectively are being transformed to become, to look more like Jesus. So I think when people come to our church, when people come to uh, spend time with us as a community, they should come away thinking, that person looks like Jesus. That, pers- that group looks like Jesus. Isn't that a high bar? <laughs> Isn't the bar up here? Did you remember any of the things Jesus did? <laughs> Look at the stories. He, he, he healed people. He did miracles. He, he, not only the miraculous stuff, but he loved his enemies. He was kind to his disciples. Well, sometimes he gave them a little bit of a, a rebuke, but, but he loved them. He was so kind to them. He loved, loved the people around him. So when we, Jesus' death and his resurrection um, it accomplishes something very significant. It, it makes us more like him. When we trust in Jesus, when we come to him and have faith in him, um, we're able to remain in him. A lot of this language, remember we talked about in Ephesians, of being in Christ. Um, this is a very profound reality of us growing in his likeness together. So... Um, yeah, I think sometimes we've, we've maybe not fully grasped this or, or maybe um, our, our eyes, the eyes of our spirit haven't been enlightened to see this profound reality. I remember my dad, my dad's a pastor, and he would, he would always say, if Jesus came and walked among our church or walked in our culture right now, I think he would come and say to us, why'd you make me look so boring? Why'd you make me look so boring? <laughs> Like, look at the life of Jesus. He was doing crazy stuff. He was, when you, I feel like if, if I went to go talk to him, if he was here physically, I feel like I wouldn't know. I'd be kind of a nervous, like, what's he going to do? Is he going to, like, do something crazy? Or, <laughs> like, there's always that, always that tension of, this is a powerful, this is the Lamb of God, but also the Lion of God. This is someone who has power. And, and I think when we come together into his presence, we should kind of feel that same, like, what's going to happen? Like, when we get together, the, the power of the Lord is present. What's, what's going to happen? Like, maybe there's a little bit of that fear of God, like, Lord, I'm a little nervous because I'm not perfect and, and I need you to purify me. When I come to your presence, I want to be, I want my heart to be pure before you, Lord. So I think, I think here at Trinity, we have a pretty unusual group. That's a compliment. That's a compliment. Uh, we have a pretty unusual group of people who, who are very sensitive to God, who are very open to, or very strong in their prayers and prayer life. Um, there's, there's a strong belief, I sense, among us that if it's in the Bible, uh, Lord, you can do it. We trust you. There's a really strong faith here at Trinity. And, and to be honest, I think it's, that's very unique here. We, ha- we have a lot of people who, who are very, have a very strong desire for God's presence. 
And so I really want to encourage us to press into these things deeper. Um, personally, I think this time during COVID has kind of shaken my life around a little bit. I'm sure it's shaken you guys a little bit too. And I think this is an opportunity for us to really come to the Lord and say, Lord, these other things in my life don't matter. It's only you that matters. It's really only you that matters. Like all these things that we, we fill our time with, a lot of them are okay, but they just distract us from you. So I want to encourage you and all of us as the body of Christ to really draw back to Christ, draw back to wanting to encounter the Lord's presence together.